One in three people attending primary care experience a mental health problem, but only 24% of them will receive treatment. Dr. Sheila Hardy works for the Charlie Waller Trust and hopes this film will make it easier for healthcare professionals working in primary care to recognise when a patient in their care has a common mental problem and to know what to do next. We have made this video in partnership with NHS England South East. Content has been adapted from training that is endorsed by the Royal College of Nursing. You can download the accompanying handout which has some reflective questions useful for revalidation. So when you first attended primary care, were, were you upfront about how you were feeling? To be honest, I was not open about how I was feeling. It was much easier and more manageable to limit the disclosures to the fact that I'd collapsed. Um, I, I didn't volunteer information about the previous few months, you know, the sleep, the unhealth the coping strategies uh, and the personal circumstances, you know, the relationship breakdown, etc. This film covers the conditions which are defined as common mental health problems, how to screen for depression and anxiety, how to use tools designed to assess the severity of depression, how to assess suicide risk, the treatments available for common mental health problems, the agencies which offer treatment for common mental health problems. Common mental health problems are described by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in their guidance as depression, obsessional compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The last psychiatric survey carried out in England found that nearly half of adults thought they had experienced a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in their life. But only a fifth of men and a third of women received the diagnosis by a healthcare professional. A national survey of well-being showed that a fifth of people in the UK over the age of 16 years had symptoms of anxiety or depression, with a higher proportion among females than males. According to a systematic review, depression was the second leading cause of disability globally, with lower back pain being the first. Depression can negatively affect how a person feels, thinks and behaves. They may feel sad or experience a loss of interest in activities they once enjoyed. It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems and reduce a person's ability to operate both at work and at home. The symptoms and experience of depression vary in every person. Outcomes are influenced by personality, resilience, family history, premorbid difficulties, for example, trauma and sexual abuse, relationships and social problems. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, Guidelines for Depression employ the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM, to define the condition. This is published by the American Psychiatric Association and offers a common language and standard criteria for the classification of mental disorders. The version described by NICE is the DSM-4, though it's since been updated to DSM-5. There are nine criteria for diagnosis. The types of depression are sub-threshold depression, where a person has fewer than five of the diagnostic criteria. Mild depression. A person has five or more of the diagnostic criteria and the symptoms result in minor functional impairment. Moderate depression. A person has five or more of the diagnostic criteria and between mild and severe functional impairment. Major depressive disorder, MDD is also referred to as severe depression, where a person experiences most of the diagnostic criteria and the symptoms markedly interfere with functioning, which can occur with or without psychotic symptoms. 
persistent depressive disorder. A person experiences low mood that has lasted for at least two years but may not have reached the intensity of major depression. Seasonal affective disorder arises when the days get shorter in the autumn and winter. There are types of depression which are exclusive to women, trans men and non-binary people. Perinatal depression includes major and minor depressive episodes that occur during pregnancy or in the first 12 months after delivery, also known as postpartum depression. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is a severe form of premenstrual syndrome. The symptoms usually begin in the late luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, shortly after ovulation, and end once menstruation starts. Fear is the normal emotion to feel in response to a danger or threat. When a person experiences fear, they trigger their fight or flight response. The body adapts psychologically and physically enabling the person to either run away or to fight to their maximum ability. Anxiety occurs when the fight-flight response is triggered inappropriately, so a normal reaction to an abnormal stimulus. This stimulus is often the thought of a threat or something going wrong in the future, but it could be due to the circumstances they are in at the time. It can lead to avoidance of the situation that creates anxiety. The physical consequences of the fight-flight response, tachycardia, rapid breathing, muscle tension, nausea, trembling, are sometimes viewed by the person as being caused by a physical illness. Most anxiety disorders go unrecognized, and those that are diagnosed are treated in primary care. Types of anxiety include Generalized anxiety disorder, excessive worry about different events associated with heightened tension. Social anxiety disorder, persistent fear of or anxiety about one or more social situations that is out of proportion to the actual threat from them. Panic disorder, reoccurring unforeseen panic attacks followed by at least one month of persistent worrying about having another panic attack. Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, the presence of obsessions and or compulsions. Post-traumatic stress disorder can develop after a stressful event or situation of exceptional threatening or catastrophic nature that is likely to cause pervasive distress in almost anyone. To recap, common mental health problems include depression and anxiety, which can negatively affect how a person thinks, feels and behaves. Most people with a mental illness in England are treated in primary care. Yet mental illness is unrecognised in two-thirds of those attending. National guidance for common mental health problems advocates that healthcare professionals working in primary care have a responsibility to identify common mental health problems, assess the severity, provide relevant information and consider any special needs. They should also offer the correct treatment options for those with mild to moderate problems and make an appropriate referral for those who have a moderate to severe common mental health problem. The National Confidential Inquiry assert there should be a mechanism in place to ensure that people who present with major physical health issues are addressed and monitored for depression and risk of suicide. This is because this cohort are two to three times more likely to have depression than those with good physical health. Often, people do not recognise they have a mental health problem and they may present with a physical health problem such as increased tiredness, bowel problems, difficulties with sleep, 
headaches or change in appetite. Report an increase in smoking, alcohol or drug consumption. Attend to discuss a problem with their long-term condition without realising the cause is psychological. For example, a person with diabetes may attend because their blood glucose readings are elevated, which may be because they've stopped eating healthily and exercising because they're feeling low. To ascertain whether someone has depression or anxiety, there are screening questions available. Two for depression, two for anxiety, and a help question. The person simply answers yes or no. An answer of no to the first four questions indicates that the person is unlikely to have depression or anxiety. The help question improves the specificity of diagnosis. This means if a person answers yes to one of the screening questions and then declines help, this is usually because they do not have an underlying depression or anxiety. They should be given the option of coming back to see a healthcare professional should they change their mind. An answer of yes to any of the questions should trigger a more detailed assessment using the patient health questionnaire, PHQ-9, and generalized anxiety disorder assessment, GAD-7. If a person attends and reports they are feeling down, depressed or anxious, they can be assessed with the PHQ-9 and GAD-7, i.e. there is no need to use the screening questions. The healthcare professional should use the consultation time to listen to patients. Listening is often not regarded as an intervention, but is valued by patients. The listening should be done actively, using eye contact, nodding and open gestures. What is being said should be paraphrased to ensure mutual understanding, and empathetic comment should be offered to encourage hope. For example, I understand how you are feeling. There are things we can do to help you. Or, I know everything may feel impossible at this present moment, but I've seen people in a similar situation to yourself, and they have got better. Investigations are not indicated routinely when a person presents with depression, but may be necessary to exclude other causes of symptoms. In someone with predominant fatigue, these blood tests are helpful. Full blood count to exclude anemia. Thyroid function test to exclude hypothyroidism. Vitamin D to exclude deficiency. There are some drugs which may cause depressed mood. Though this is uncommon, these include centrally acting antihypertensives, for example, methyl dopa, lipid soluble beta blockers, for example, propranolol benzodiazepines or other central nervous system depressants, opioid analgesics. The patient health questionnaire is a tool to measure the severity of depression which has been validated for use in primary care. It's usually referred to as the PHQ-9. It comprises nine questions which are designed to assess the person's mood over the last two weeks. For each of the nine test criteria, there are four possible answers which are scored. Not at all equals zero points. Several days equals one point. More than half the days equals two points. Nearly every day equals three points. The PHQ-9 scores are added up and the depression severity is graded based on this. Zero to four, none. 5 to 9, mild. 10 to 14, moderate. 15 to 19, moderately severe. 20 to 27, severe. Anxiety is measured using the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Assessment, which is validated for primary care and referred to as the GAD-7. Each question on the GAD-7 is scored between 0 and 3 in the same way as the PHQ-9. The GAD-7 scores are added up and the anxiety severity is graded based on this. 1 to 9, mild anxiety. 
10 to 14, moderate. 15 to 21 is severe. Both the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 provide only probable diagnosis. Therefore, further clinical evaluation is required. They can be used at regular intervals to monitor progress. Studying the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 questions for those patients who score 2 or 3 per question guides the practitioner to choose the most appropriate therapy. For example, a high score on the PHQ-9 question 7, having trouble concentrating, could be treated with the use of worrying time and or behavioural activation. There are more details about this in the accompanying handout. Mental health and well-being are influenced not only by a person's individual attributes, but also by the social circumstances in which they find themselves and the environment in which they live. It's important to consider biological, psychological and social factors, such as the quality of their relationships, any support from their family, friends, colleagues or others, their living conditions, employment issues and alcohol or substance misuse. To recap, healthcare professionals working in primary care have a responsibility to identify common mental health problems, assess the severity, provide relevant information and offer the correct treatment options. Please pause the film here for discussion and refer to the facilitator's notes for guidance. Suicide is defined by the American Psychiatric Association as the act of killing yourself, most often because of depression or other mental illness. The Office for National Statistics Bulletin, released in 2019 regarding suicide in the UK in 2018, states that there were 6,507 suicides registered in the UK, the first increase since 2013. Three quarters of these deaths were among men. The highest age-specific suicide rate was for those aged 45 to 49 years, but those in the under-25s is increasing. The most common method of suicide in the UK was hanging. According to the World Health Organization 2019, these people are most at risk of suicide. National guidance advocates that when a person presents with a possible common mental health problem, they should always be asked directly about suicidal ideation and intent. Have you ever made a suicide attempt in the past? A positive answer should cause you concern. Do you think that life is not worth living? Many people who are not suicidal think this. It's useful to share with patients that this is a common thought amongst people who are depressed. Do you think about harming or killing yourself? This is a common thought. A positive response should prompt the next questions. Have you got a plan to kill yourself? How would you do it? If they have no plan, there is no need to continue with the question. If they do, then ask the next question. Do you aim to carry out this plan? If yes, this person is actively suicidal. Have you got access to the necessary tools to carry out the plan? Having the tools means the patient has prepared themselves. What would stop or is stopping you from carrying out your plan? Often patients choose not to attempt suicide because of commitments to family, friends or faith. When asking the person about suicide, the healthcare professional should take the following action. If there is no suicidal ideation, make a record that the assessment of suicide risk has been made and the person has no suicidal thoughts. If there is suicidal ideation but no plan, make a record that an assessment of suicide risk has been made and the person has suicidal thoughts but no current intent. Any advice and action should be recorded. The person and those involved in caring for them should be advised to immediately seek help, GP or out-of-hours service,
if they start to think about making a plan, are concerned, or if their situation deteriorates. To signpost to sources of help, for example staying safe, the Samaritans shout. To be watchful for changes in mood, negativity and hopelessness, and suicidal intent, particularly during high-risk periods, such as initiation of, or changes to antidepressant medication, or at times of increased stress. If there is a suicidal ideation with intent to carry out, arrange immediate referral to mental health services following local procedure. If the suicidal person is accompanied by a friend or family member, they may be asked by the mental health service team to attend one of their locations. The team may come to the practice, but there could be a delay. The person should not be left unaccompanied. National guidance advocates that when a person presents with a possible common mental health problem, they should be asked directly about suicidal ideation and intent. Please pause the film here for discussion and refer to the facilitator's notes for guidance. The treatment for people with common mental health problems that can be provided by healthcare professionals working in primary care are active monitoring, also known as watchful waiting. This is the decision between the healthcare professional and patient to not treat and to intermittently reassess along some rational time course in follow-up. Support to aid physical, psychological and social well-being such as healthy lifestyle behaviours, self-help strategies and social activities. Psychoeducation. The person learns about their condition and its treatment and what to do in a crisis, have the opportunity to express their feelings about their condition and its treatment and receive support to comply with medication or other treatment. Antidepressant medication. These are an effective treatment for people with moderate to severe depression. Antidepressant medication does not usually work for people with mild depression, so should not normally be prescribed for this group. Some antidepressant medication is licensed for anxiety. The response to treatment usually occurs within two weeks. This treatment can improve concentration and lift energy levels so the person is more able to engage in psychological treatments. When newly prescribed or a change in dose or type is made, the person should be reviewed two weeks later to assess the effect. The medication is usually prescribed for at least six months after patients report they feel better to prevent relapse. This period may be extended for subsequent episodes. Serotonin, along with noradrenaline and dopamine, is one of the main neurotransmitters in mood disorders. It is hypothesized that depression is associated with a lack of serotonin. Antidepressant drugs exert their effect by boosting serotonin levels in the brain. Selective serotonin inhibitors, SSRIs, do this by inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin into the neuron, effectively training the brain into producing more of the neurotransmitter. Healthcare professionals prescribe SSRI first. If there is no response, then a different SSRI should be used before trying another type of antidepressant. In the patients that fail to respond to SSRI, about half will improve with either a different SSRI or class of antidepressant. National guidance advocates that healthcare professionals in primary care should ensure the referral is appropriate by taking account of patient preference, referring for the least intrusive, most effective intervention first. And if harmful drinking or alcohol dependency is also present, these behaviours should be treated first as it may lead to significant improvement in depressive or anxiety symptoms. There are many treatments delivered by other agencies.
Healthcare professionals should have an up-to-date record of the contact details of the services they may refer to. These may include improving access to psychological therapies, IAPT program, counselling services, third sector organisations, secondary care mental health services. Treatment for common mental health problems can be delivered in primary care or by other local agencies. Healthcare professionals need to be aware of their local care pathway. Please pause the film here for discussion and refer to facilitator notes for guidance. Healthcare professionals referring patients to mental health services need to advise them about this choice and signpost them to the nhs.uk website for more information. Healthcare professionals in primary care have a responsibility to recognise when patients might have a common mental health problem. They should provide information about the treatment options and to make appropriate referrals. They can also offer suggestions to aid physical, psychological and social well-being. 